open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, I want to talk briefly about what I refer to as a balanced pulpit, a balanced pulpit, balanced preaching. You know, people use these words sometimes uh, without understanding the biblical context. The, uh, we like to say he has to be balanced, or that wasn't balanced. Well, your idea of what, balance, what a good balance is and my idea, they're irrelevant. What, what, what does the Bible consider to be a right balance when it comes to preaching? Uh, you know, it says in Isaiah, my way is not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's, sometimes it's hard for us to think in those terms. It, the Lord doesn't look at things the way we do. Uh, our understanding of things, of fairness and what is uh, right or wrong, uh, they're skewed by sin and by personal bias. And you've got to go to the Bible. Uh, you, without going and finding out what God has to say about something, you just... You talk like a fool. I mean, your opinion might be important to you and other people might admire you and think you're learned and whatever, but if it doesn't... Let me give you an idea. Balance, we think in terms of 50-50. He's balanced. Now, when it comes to preaching, God has a different standard of what what, what a, a, a balance should be. Uh, starting in the first verse in chapter 4, 2 Timothy, this is Paul giving his charge to his ministerial young man. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Those are two judgments there, by the way. And uh, he says in verse 2, Preach the word. Preach it. Don't preach yourself. Preach the word. To, and, and go easy on the stories. I mean, illustrations are necessary. Uh, and and they and they make for good sermons if they're properly if they're spaced right and not overdone. But preach the word. Uh, be instant in season and out of season. When you feel like it and when you don't feel like it, you say, "Why would you have to say that?" Because <laughs> the flesh is the flesh is the flesh, and there's lots of times a preacher is going to get up on a Sunday morning and he's just not going to be all with it. Uh, he just doesn't feel like uh, whatever uh, the way he thinks he needs to feel on a Sunday to properly project uh, God's words. But you do it because you're called to do it if you're a preacher. Now he says here, the three things here in verse 2, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Three things. Now, two of them are negative. One is positive. So the balance here is two-thirds on the negative side, and that's found in the uh, reproving and rebuking. And exhortation I consider to be positive, a necessary thing for preachers. Now, what's a, repro a, a reproof? It's a warning. It, it, you know, straighten out, or you're going the wrong way, or things are not right. It's a warning. It, it could be a, a gentle warning, it could be a stern warning. It's a reproof. It's a warning, and it's needful. Uh, I remember just some while ago we had on Sunday morning and, and then Sunday evening a, a, a wonderful balance. Uh, Pastor Donovan at the Bible Baptist Church had in the morning uh, a message on uh, the judgment seat of Christ, a real warning, and it was excellent. And that night there was an exhortation uh, to press ahead, and it was a perfect balance there that, that particular day of reproving and then exhortation. And it uh, doesn't happen every Sunday that way. But th the Spirit of God knows what the congregation needs to hear. Not necessarily what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And he has to work through the preacher. And the preachers are, all, in many cases, not submissive to what God, the Holy Spirit, wants said. Now you say, why should that be with God's ministers? Well, because God's ministers are flesh, like anybody else, and they're prone to certain restrictions or constrictions. They're constrained sometimes. They have people there in the pulpit, believe it or not, that they might be afraid 
uh, they might be afraid these people might get offended, uh, dear friends or whatever, and not come back. Or they, they, they're they're constrained by that. They, you know, when I used to preach, and uh, I went out to Texas many times to preach uh, a number of years ago, and I kept saying, "Do I have liberty? Do I have liberty?" Because there's things I believe the Lord wants me to say. I want to be able to feel free in saying them. Am I constrained in any way here? Is there anybody that's uh, uh, got a mindset about what preaching should be and should not be? Because I might, <laughs> I might blur those lines in that person's mind. And, and I, I want to know that the Spirit of God can move me in certain ways and I can say things that will give them food for thought, uh, maybe encourage them, maybe terrorize them. I don't know. And it's important. Same thing uh, by me speaking on the Final Fight Bible Radio, and I thank God uh, Brother Matt Crane was uh, very understanding in that regard. Do I have liberty? Can I say the things that I believe God moves me to say? I'm not always going to be on target. I understand that. I'm flesh, and I have my own uh, sets of biases formed over the years by experience and contacts and dealings with people. Uh, but I want to be true to what God shows me, and I don't want to hold back. I do not want to have regrets at the judgment seat of Christ, and I wasn't plain enough, clear enough, or I held back for the sake of sparing someone's feelings. All right, If you've listened to me for, for a while or whatever, you know I'm the offensive Christian. I'm liable to offend, and I have no problem with that. I'm not going to go home and wring my hands over it. Oh, did anybody get upset? Uh if you're prone to getting upset over things that are said plainly and bother you, what could I say? You know, grow up. So what you have today, unfortunately, in many pulpits is a, a, a lady will see a nursery for children where preachers are afraid to get somebody upset. They, they want to be liked. There's that human, I, do you like me? You know, I mentioned before we had Ed Koch as mayor in New York for 12 years. He went around saying, how am I doing? How am I doing? Listen, if you've got to keep asking people how you're doing, there's something wrong, you know? If you know you're doing right and you're doing what a mayor should do and you're making the tough decisions, you don't have to go around saying, how am I doing? But a politician really has to be sensitive to that. Because the first duty of a politician is to get himself or herself reelected. But that's not the case with a preacher. <laughs> He's not running for office. He's not taking a public opinion poll. He's there to deliver faithfully what God wants him to say. So there's three things here. And I mentioned reproving. Now, rebuking is a little different. Rebuking is uh, it's more than just a warning. It's You get read out. You get the riot act in some cases. Uh, put to you. A rebuke is sharp. A rebuke is, hey, I'm not just warning you, I'm telling you straighten out or else. You're rebuking somebody. I'm talking about believers. Uh, Paul was very clear on that when he dealt with the Corinthian church, and he was told that there was somebody there that was uh, fornicating, and uh, he said that he was going to turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That's powerful. That's powerful. But he told those Corinthians, I, I, they should have done it already. In other words, they should have gotten him out of there. Uh, they should have removed him. But he said, you're puffed up. Meaning, it, these are the people who kept saying, we love you, we love you, God loves you, we love you. And they had so much love that they allowed him to stay there in his sin. And you know the saying, a bad apple can poison a whole barrel. They allowed him to sit there knowing, <coughs> knowing his, his sin uh, and didn't act. And that's why Paul got upset. He said, you're puffed up. You're puffed up with this, you know, we have so much love here. We're not going to come down hard on our brother. We're, we're just going to love him back to the Lord. How's that? Are you kidding? So I could just imagine this tough old Jew, Paul, looking, looking at these Corinthian Christians and saying, forget about it. It doesn't work that way. Get him out of there. Or I'll turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Now, we got many pastors today who don't believe in that. You see, they don't uh, believe in shunning or whatever. They uh, allow Christians who are in rebellion to sit there and uh, remain uh, pretty much comfortable. Uh, and that's what I call the, the, the Laodicean mindset. 
that has crept into the pulpits. You know, does everybody like me? Am I doing a good job? Will you come back next week? If I don't offend anybody, will you keep coming and put the money in the basket so I can keep eating and all of that? I never was uh, affected by that fear, thank God, when I passed it in Brooklyn for 15, 16 years. I had my own job. I had my own income, and I was basically able to be sustained that way. If you didn't come, if you didn't like the preaching, too bad. Uh, whether you put money in it or not, or you left, that was, I wasn't going to lose any sleep over it one way or another. All I knew is I had people there that I believed really needed to hear the truth, and they were going to hear it. And uh, thank God it had the right effect. Now, the last one is exhortation, which we all need. We grow weary in the way. We grow weary we need to be encouraged and exhortation. Oh, it's like a cold glass of water on a hot day. It's, it's refreshing. It's the Lord telling you, I'm with you, I'm behind you. Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. That's an exhortation. Go on, press ahead. You're near the end now. Keep going. I had, uh, years ago, uh, embraced Acts 20, 24 as a verse uh, to guide my life. But none of these things moved me, Paul said, uh, meaning he was just told that troubles were going to come and he was saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders and they were crying because he was on his way to Jerusalem and, and they, they knew, according to the prophecy there, they were getting that he was going to have trouble there and things weren't going to go well. And they also knew that they weren't going to see his face anymore because he told them. And uh, it was a sad occasion. But he said, none of these things move me. I, I got to keep going. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. In other words, if I lose, lose my life for the cause of Christ, so what? That's why I enlisted as a soldier for Jesus Christ. None of these things move me. Neither I, I count I my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy. There's a difference here. Some finish their course without joy with a lot of grief and sadness, that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He just wanted to finish the race standing up and not falling down at the finish line. It's a beautiful picture of Paul saying, I'm going on, I'm going on, no matter what, I'm going on. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people in church that are far from being disciples. They sit there, they remain in sin and rebellion. In many cases, they're in a church where they're not afraid where the preacher's going to get on their case, and they're comfortable, and they don't move one way or another, and they stay there week in and week out, month in, and, and there's no real movement. And many of these congregations, small or large, in my opinion, just perpetuate babe, uh, the, the child a childhood. These are Christians that'll never grow up, never grow up. Sometimes they got to be shook up hard. There was a, a movie that left an impression on me years ago. I don't even think I was saved when I first saw it. It was called the DI, which is drill instructor. And uh, it, it, it had the uh, guy that played dra Dragnet, Jack Webb, was the star of that. It was about young men that had been drafted into the Marines, and they were in boot camp. And he was the drill instructor. And, oh, boy, what, what he had to do to get these boys to become men, men that could go into combat. And the things that he said to them, he broke them down. He broke them down so that they would be good and effective as a combat unit. You know, we're living in a time because of this Laodicean mindset, the pastors are unwilling to do that kind of work. I call that roto rooter work. Sometimes you got to get in there and be very plain and say, listen, this has to be straightened out. This has to be corrected. But no, no, to turn on Christian radio and TV, for the most part, it's a joke. It's really, it's all about you, your relations, how you feel today. You okay? I'm glad you're feeling good. God just loves you. He cares so much about you. He's so happy that you're saved and you're here at church. Oh, la di da di da. Hold hands and let's sing Kumbaya and we'll all feel better. I mean, give me a break. What is this? That's what Christian babies are going to stay babies forever under that kind of preaching. They're never going to grow. They're never going to grow. You've got to use the sword. You've got to use the sword. I'm going to just refer you briefly to a note, uh, Dr. Ruckman. If you have a Ruckman reference Bible, 
you ought to look at this note. It's uh, what he says here on the uh, in Romans. It's Romans 7.24. If you turn to that for a second. Romans 7.24 in the Ruckman Reference Bible. Boy, some of these notes, they, they, really, they really hit home. I so much appreciate this labor that Dr. Ruckman left us. On that verse, it says in chapter 7 of Romans, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's Paul talking about himself. Imagine that. O wretched man that I am. Paul comes right out and tells the Romans, hey, I got a problem. There's something wrong with me. And he, before he describes the, the tug of war between the spirit and the flesh. But you think pastors are going to address their congregations that way? Ye who are evil know how to give good things to your children. You know, and here's Ruckman's note on that, 724. It says, for example, Louis the Fourteenth, that's the king of France, said to a Huguenot preacher, Huguenots were French Protestants that were very much persecuted by Catholics, he said, for example, Louis, King Louis said, I've heard many great sermons, and I've been highly pleased with them. But whenever I hear you, I go away displeased with myself. Well, amen. Sounds like you got a preacher there. Bob Jones Sr. said, if a preacher doesn't make you feel mean, he is no good. Now, now think about this. Think, because this is opposite the way we think or the way we feel. That's why he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. On a regular basis, two out of every three times, you should be getting stuff from the pulpit that makes you feel like a rotten, low-down snake, still fooling around with sin or living in rebellion with a need to get right. We lack holiness. We lack holiness. And we don't want to obey. Children don't want to obey. That's the way children are. Now the preaching has to do something about that. Has to somehow turn that around. Change people. But more often than not, it doesn't. Why? Well, we just have, want people to have a good experience. And they look forward to coming to church. And we have a lot of fellowship. And who smiles and who sings and who this and who that. Brothers and sisters, this is pathetic, and it's only going to get worse. But I'm, I'm addressing the ministers here. I'm addressing those men that go into the pulpit. Are you ready to preach the way God wants you to preach? Now, there's a difference between preaching and teaching, and I'm going to say very plainly, some men could be excellent Bible teachers, very good, skillful, and gifted. But preaching? Not so. And some men could be very good preachers. And as Bible teachers, very sad. Very sad. In need of much improvement. Now that's the way it is. And that's what I've experienced over the years of I've heard and listened to. And I've heard quite a few. And if a man like Bob Jones said, if he doesn't make you feel miserable because you're coming to church in your sins. Okay, you, st you have sin. You have issues. You have problems with the Lord. There's contention there that has to be dealt with. And there are times you need to be encouraged and exhorted. I understand that. Now, that's balance in the pulpit. Some are not going to like what I said. Too bad. Amen. Amen.